Let us pray. God of us all, here we are in week three of Lent. Thank you for this season, this day, this hour. Thank you for an opportunity to lean into the lament in ways that we can value its practice and trust your presence within it. Thank you for Anna, for her wisdom, her insights, her experiences, and her family. Thank you for all of the people gathered here tonight. Whatever is happening in each of their lives, please make yourself known to them in a way they can fully experience your grace. Tend their needs, mend them with mercy, and buoy them up with your spirit. Empower them to love with your love and live as you have abundantly called them to be alive. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And Anna, we invite you to uh, share whatever you have to offer us tonight. We're glad you're here. Thank you. It is a pleasure to be here again. I'm going to put out the alert that I am so eager for conversation. We had a, a really good conversation uh, last week, and I encourage all of you to feel comfortable asking questions. Um, and um, I, I have to confess, I think my daughter just came home. She's a, a receptionist at a um, uh, at a, a healthcare facility and she just got her first vaccine. Um, and so I was hearing some commotion out there. So I apologize if I missed you announcing uh, uh, how to ask questions, um, but in, just in case I didn't, feel free to enter those in the chat um, or wave madly and we'll make sure uh, to, to get your questions. I am not paying attention to the chat. Um, uh, I am anyway a, a distractible woman, and so I, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to tempt me to be even more so um, uh, that natural inclination of mine. Um, so I won't see any messages that you folks might send to me directly. Instead, um, you can just send them to Pastor Karen, and that, um, that would do the trick. Um, all right, with that, uh, let, us, uh, let us begin um, our evening on lament. Um, I have to say that the tonight I think is going to kind of be our pivot point, our transition from topics that have been a little bit on the, um, uh, if you were to think about an emotional spectrum, um, they're more on the on the sorrowful side, right? Um, to then moving to experiences and and faith uh, faith claims that lean into hope and that lean into some new possibilities. Um, to that degree, I have a book coming out um, later this year or early into next year from Fortress um, about joy. Um, that's the theme. And for those who know me, I, 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 that might actually surprise you. I'm not known, I think, for being dour, but, um, but there's something about the notion of joy that just has kind of bugged me. I have an allergic reaction um, to it. it. Joy has always seemed to be somewhat saccharine and kitschy. And in fact, um, as I've been trying to maybe psychoanalyze myself about this, I did, I did an, uh, an etymological study and I dis discovered that the word joy uh, comes from the Latin word gaude, G-A-U-D-E. And we know this for those who might be familiar with, with hymnody, uh, we know this um, uh, because the word gaude means joy in, in a variety of familiar hymns. Um, but it also is directly related to the word gaudy. And <laughs> I think that's been my uh, my relationship, my mental relationship, that joy is of the gaudy. It's saccharine. It's, it can be cheesy. It's got this kind of don't worry, be happy vibe. And I can't, I can't, I can't, I just can't do that. Um, and in fact, as I may have mentioned earlier um, in one of our earlier sessions, um, after the accident, I was invited to join a church that had as its name Spirit of Joy. And to be honest, I eventually did, but the name never stopped bugging me. Um, my husband, uh, as some of you have, uh, have heard who have been here before, my husband had just been killed in an accident. My son had just suffered a very traumatic brain injury. My baby girl had been deprived of, of her father and her brother who just a few months prior had held her and read to her. Um, 
suddenly there for I was a newly single parent. I was thrust into a new job and a new town and a new life and grief, the depths of which were quite honestly unfathomable. And of all the adjectives that could have been ascribed to me at that time, spirit of joy was not among them, right? And to be quite honest, therefore, I never fully felt welcome there or that I could fully be absorbed into that community because I just, I felt by the very name of the place that I was somehow or another compelled by my very faith to feel a joy that certainly at that time would have been nothing but manufactured, nothing but, but artificial in the extreme. And so the message sent by the name of this congregation was that to be a Christian is essentially a word that etymologically means of your esse, your essence, right? To feel joy all the blame time. I mean, how many of us know that camp song, the chorus of which goes, I feel the joy, 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 joy down in my heart, right? But conversely, how many of us even know the song, let alone the words, to, oh God, why are you silent? Now, the observation isn't meant to shame at all because there are countless reasons at hand to ground why we don't have a handle on how or even whether to feel grief, to feel lament, to even raise our fist at God. And so that there is the topic at hand this evening. And so in our time together tonight, I'm, I'm hoping that we can establish this framework for entertaining the idea that lament is perhaps one of the greatest acts of faith in God. And I believe it is one of the most poignant communal expressions of the communion of the saints. But it is also as we move slowly but surely in this season of Lent toward Easter to lay the groundwork for the notion that I don't think we can fully appreciate joy or praise until we know lament. So here is an interesting nugget that I've discovered in our own our old green book, which here, those of you who look. You, we all remember this one, right? Came out in 78. Um, and it was, it's been in use for several decades. Some congregations, particularly in some of the more rural areas of the ELCA, still use it on the, on the regular. In our old green book, right? Um, up uh, up uh, or in, the, in the section uh, entitled the Psalms, all of the Psalms, the lament psalms were taken out. Every single one was taken out. It was as if the editors somehow or another took this gigantic grief magnet over the Psalter and sucked up every last passage that had anything to do with the experience of grief and God's presence or God's absence within it. Now I see, uh, I see my dad has joined. I, I might be putting him on the spot here. Um, you can wave up your hand at if you're interested or not um, to, to kick in here. But my father was a, a professor at Concordia College um, in the religion department back in the day. And he, uh, he uh, worked with a, um, uh, a colleague of his entitled or named Les Meyer. Dad, can you hit that mute button and, uh, and maybe just kind of give a brief little blurb about, about Les? What can you tell them about Les? Well, I'm, and I'm not sure that I'm coming through now. Yeah, yeah. Are you hearing me? Well, you are. Yeah. Well, <laughs> do, you, do you have the next 45 minutes so that I can no, talk no, about Lester? Oh, too bad. No, too bad. Uh -uh. Uh, Les Meyer was a dear friend and a dear colleague of mine as uh, Les Meyer's uh, family. Les Meyer had his... Uh, PhD from the University of Chicago in Old Testament studies. So my work was in New Testament studies. And so we worked um, hand in hand. But uh, as Anna may be about to tell you that um, and Lester was, was uh, Germanic and he was very orderly. 
and very precise and uh, very bright and loaded with delightful humor. But Les, um, Les had some of the similar concerns as to which you've already been um, introduced by Anna about lamentations. And I think uh, what you are about to hear uh, is a word or two from Les uh, about his um, uh, profound concern about the elimination of lament psalms from, of all things, a book of worship in the life of the church. Right. Thanks, Ted. Right. Um, what Dad didn't say um, is that uh, the two of them, we joke, were kind of like the odd couple. And so, um, so Dad was Oscar oh. to his Felix. Um, so, Ron, so the two of them were, were close friends. And it's actually thanks to, uh, it's thanks to Dad um, that I came across this article. If you Google um, uh, the Lutheran Quarterly, it's called A Lack of Laments in the Church's Use of the Psalter. So, it, he was terribly polite, and that came across in all of his in all of his writings. Um, but it, he wrote this whole piece because it irked him to no end that the editors had eliminated every opportunity for the communion of uh, of God to 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 express despair. And so, um, so he 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 wrote he wrote this. He said um, uh, it, it, that he said although the LBW. Uh, called this section the Psalms, the heading is somewhat misleading, he said, since the section does not, in point of fact, contain all the biblical Psalms. It would seem ungrateful to complain when Lutherans who use this worship book have more than 80% of the Psalter so conveniently available. But nevertheless, and then he went on from there. And so he, he, he leads the reader into this foray about ancient Israel's sense of God and highlights how Israelites were acutely aware both of God's presence and God's hiddenness. The latter, he said, is the very thing out of which these lament psalms sprung. Although their life is certainly different, namely that of the ancient people of Israel, um, then our lives, there, there are overlaps to be sure. One of which is this, our well-being is notably well-er when the world appears to be going well. And so while there can be these occasional blips, moments of frustration or annoyances, we can metabolize them as, as just flukes, annoying and irritating as they are. But when we experience, right, an abundance of evil, of suffering, of inequity, of death, and general nonsense, we're left gasping for sense, for order to somehow or another be regained. In other words, said Les, right? We and Israel wonder if God is so great and is the creator of all, what is this mess? But I think that in stark contrast to the ancient Israelites, we Christians run the risk of seeing these raised questions and raised lament as in point of fact, somehow or another, unfaithful. Jews wrote the lament psalms and Christians eliminated them from our Psalter. So in related news just today, I did this quick survey this afternoon um, uh, reviewing the LBW, the green book, and the, ELD, the ELW, right? The red book, the, the, this, this one right here, right? With which many of us might be familiar. Um, because I was curious, uh, not just about the, uh, about the psalm situation, but also the hymn situation. And here is what I discovered. In the LBW, there is not only no section whatsoever allotted for hymns of lament or hymns of grief, there are no hymns even designated as such in the index. Okay. In contrast, though, in the ELW, we have a huge, or wait, in contrast, to, it's still in the LBW, we have a huge section of praise and adoration. So hymn numbers from 514 to 551. So 37 mm -hmm. hymns are dedicated in the LBW for praise mm -hmm. and adoration. And on celebration and jubilation, we got ourselves 13 hymns from 552 to 565. And on Christian hope, um, so 313 to 352, we've got 
39 hymns in the LBW. And of that latter section, right? It's not hope because we're in the pit of despair. It's no, um, uh, Jerusalem, my happy home or oh, what is their joy? I mean, it's fascinating to me, right? That a generational hymnal ignores lament and arguably even censors it. It somehow or another is conveyed that it's an untouchable experience of life. And clearly it's perceived to be an unallowable experience of faith. But in contrast, right, the ELDL, ELW, it's got heaps of hymns related specifically to lament and healing and comfort and grief and sorrow. And it has all of the Psalms. So what is it, right, about lament, even lament that is found in the Bible, so scriptural lament that's made the editors uncomfortable? So a few theories have crossed my mind, um, and we're going to dive into a few of them tonight, uh, three of them. A lack of confidence in grace, a fear of disrespecting God. And this latent notion that our God is somehow or another more akin to Zeus than to Yahweh. So let's dive in. A mentor of mine, a rabbi, points out that Christians are often afraid of doubting, of admitting uncertainty about and before God. Jews, however, he said, Jews wrestle with God, and they do so both by way of anger, and we'll talk a little bit about that um, later, although I hope we dive into more of that by way of conversation. So Jews wrestle with God, and they do so by way of anger, and also by way of love making. Both encounter God out of very real, but different expressions of what it is to be human. But Christians are not as down with doubt. And I think we're afraid of it because we, even we Lutherans, right, who are ostensibly all about grace, are a teensy-weensy bit afraid of this. What if we doubt? And what if we end up disbelieving? And what if we then, in that moment, die? Then what? And so we began our session speaking about resurrection, that is to say two weeks ago, and there's a reason for that, of course, because if it were not for the resurrection, we wouldn't see Jesus as the Christ. We'd see him as a, another model of faith, a mentor of holy living, but we wouldn't see him as the Messiah, as the son of God. So the event of the resurrection gives us our faith name, that is to say Christian, Christians, and it gives us our very reason for faith. Jesus is risen from the dead. And as we talked about last week, right, death of any sort no longer has the last word, neither a six foot under kind of death, nor the death of a hope, nor the death of fear, nor the death of sin, nor even the death of a lack of faith. So as I might have explained earlier, part of my role as a systematic theologian is to invite people to reflect on their belief system and see whether it holds water within itself. So if you say such and such a thing about God over here, you also have to say it over here, or you have to wrestle up a decent reason as to why you don't. So as an example then, there are evangelical Christians who are, as they say, pro-life. They're opposed to abortion because they say of their faith. But it turns out, looking at the rest of their social policies, these same Christians also tend to vote for less assistance to the poor and to the needy. And these same Christians also tend to vote for the death penalty. So as a systematic theologian, I got questions, right? I want to know, why do you protect an unborn baby, but the born ones less so? At what age then are they, according to God, somehow or another suddenly expendable? But in contrast, while I may personally disagree with the Roman Catholic stance on abortion, I have nothing but full on respect for the consistency of their social justice convictions. They are precisely out of their faith, not only opposed to abortion, but they are deeply invested in bettering social welfare systems. 
nuns on the bus, thank you very much. And they are utterly and unwaveringly opposed to the death penalty. Dead man walking is a perfect illustration of the complexity and the conviction uh, that Roman Catholics hold here in this regard. And so in the same way then, if you say that Jesus is risen from the dead and promises the same for us too, if you say that over here, then if there are caveats to that claim, I want to know as a systematic theologian what they are and why. To what then does a tiny asterisk after Jesus is risen, hallelujah, refer? What's the fine print? Where is that tiny little some conditions and terms and conditions may apply? Where is that whispered? And so as we fussed with last week, death comes in many forms, but scripture tells us that Jesus conquered death. So in the same way, why is it that we keep making sure that we believe and do everything just so before we die? Why do we keep using death as the metric for post-death salvation when our very base and essential faith claim is that death is rendered no longer final? Like, it's not an issue anymore. Why? Because our faith claim is that Jesus is risen. And moreover, as we talked about in our first session on resurrection, when we use the term salvation, we must not forget that the translated word in Greek is soteria, which means not what happens after you croak, but rather what happens now, right? Because the word soteria means health, healing, and wholeness. So again, as I spoke uh, in our first session, when Jesus entered into a room and said, today in me, salvation has come to you. He wasn't saying you're about ready to die, like uh, uh, spiff things up. He was saying in me, you find health, healing and wholeness. Where are you hurting? Because I am here to offer you salvation. I am here to offer you now health, healing and wholeness. Or more broadly, I think Christians can say, where in, their, in the world is there hurting, is there suffering? Because we as Christians are ambassadors of Soteria. We're ambassadors of God's salvation, of God's health, healing, and wholeness. But you see, health, healing, and wholeness is exactly the thing or are the things that one doesn't feel when one is in deep grief. And to boot, it is definitely worth noting that the word salvation proper stems from the Latin word salvatonium. And it's also related as a geeky, nerdy aside to the Greek word elpos, which means fat and oil, right? So the word that we get in Latin for the word salvation comes from the Greek meaning fat and oil. And this is relevant because it's also where we get the word salve right? As in a balm. And so what we are crying out for when we grieve, right, is nothing more but salve for our spirits. What are we lamenting for, if not balm, for our despair? And what is it that Jesus has promised us but salvation? And so when we lament, all we're doing, right, is calling out for Jesus. And to this end then, and to the second point, lament is not a lack of faith, but it is exactly the opposite. Lament is an expression of it. It is not disrespect of God, but rather lament is deep trust in God. It is leaning deeply into the grace of God, a grace born out of God's abundant and boundless love for all of us. And so your lament, your grief, your wail, your sadness, these are big, but they are not bigger than God's love for you, nor in fact are they bigger than God's solidarity with you in your pain. And this last bit might jar us because there is an arguably prevailing sense that God actually doesn't feel emotions. And relatedly, that even were God to, 
that God has some sort of immutable plan and that all things are go going exactly according to it. Any emotions that God could have, have already been accounted for. How many of us who have experienced tragedy have heard this phrase and usually with a shaken head, this must have been part of God's plan. And with that, right, any grief you feel, any anger, any emptiness is rendered null and void because God simply wanted it this way. But again, I say unto you, Jesus is risen. And that event reveals God's agenda, namely that of life and not of death. And so to put on my systematic theologian hat again, if you say that God must have a plan in this moment, then you have to be consistent that God has a plan in every moment, right? Or you have to come up with a decent explanation about why not or what those exceptions might be. So does God have a plan when uh, I, I have an itch that I have to itch? Is this part of God's plan, right? Or uh, as I was discussing yesterday in the grocery store, is it God's plan that I uh, will have ground beef instead of the chicken? Um, that was our, 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 other, our other option for our tacos. So more relevantly for tonight, if God has a plan, how does placing my late husband and son in front of that or reconcile with an empty tomb where God, the creator God, who brings life out of nothing and who brings the delight of creatures into creation, brought life out of death. It doesn't. Death and despair are not part of God's plan. God does not have a plan, but God does have an agenda, a point we will dwell in um, quite a lot in the, next few, in the next few weeks. And that agenda is life. So there's a, a woman, uh, an author uh, named Soroya Chamali. I encourage you to, to look her up. She's um, written a book I highly recommend called Rage Becomes Her. And it's a work dedicated to the truth that the expression of anger is very difficult for women to do. And it's also quite difficult for society and men in society in particular to metabolize. And so in it, she makes the claim that anger is indeed righteous. And in fact, I am of the mind that anger is in point of fact, an underrated, maybe even unrecognized Christian virtue. So Soraya Tamali is convinced that anger is a reaction when something is out of whack. There's dissonance between what is and what should be. Lament, grief, despair, these reveal the same disparity between what is and what should be. And so lament expresses then not just the immediate loss at hand, but the loss of God's vision for the world and an unwelcome realization that it is even possible when we have come instead to believe in, an, in a providential God. Lament also lets loose, I think, a deep need when one is disoriented to be reoriented to God's agenda, when one is despairing, literally to have no hope, to find somehow or another hope in spite of it all, restored. Lament is a cry like a child for a parent to offer comfort. It's a cry for balm. It's a cry for sab. It's a cry for salvation. And so to this end and to wrap up the presentation portion of the evening, let me turn to this hymn that I mentioned earlier um, if you happen to have, for whatever reason, an L uh, ELW, the Red Book, uh, in front of you, it's hymn number 703, and it is in the lament section. You'll recognize uh, the tune. Um, the text is by Marty Haugen, and the tune is by J.S. Bach. I'm going to just sing the first verse so you can have the tune in mind, and then I'll, I'll read the last, uh, the last three verses, so four verses uh, uh, in total. And it, it goes like this. Oh God, why are you silent? I cannot hear your voice. 
the proud and strong and violent all claim you and rejoice you promised you would hold me with tenderness and care draw near O oh love enfold me and ease the pain I bear. And then he goes on. My hope lies bruised and battered. My wounded heart is torn. My spirit spent and shattered by life's relentless storm. Will you not bend to hear me, my cries from deep within? Have you no word to cheer me when night is closing in? Though endless nights of weeping, through weary days of grief, my heart is in your keeping, my comfort, my relief. Come, share my tears and sadness. Come, suffer in my pain. Oh, bring me home to gladness. Restore my hope again. May pain draw forth compassion. Let wisdom draw, rise from loss. Ole, take my heart and fashion the image of your cross. Then may I know your healing through healing that I share, your grace and love revealing, your tenderness and care. Now that's a lament song, right? Um, that's, that's good fodder for conversation too. What do you have for questions or comments? I was just wondering if you would yeah. um, say a little more <clears throat> about um, you made the comment about the the terrible thing that um, people say when there's a tragedy, you know, must have been God's plan. It's terrible thing. That <laughs> yes, yes. Right. One of those. Yeah. Um, anyway. And um, but then you brought up God might have an agenda. And I like yeah. that twist. Yeah. Um, what is behind um, your thoughts on that? Right. So if you promise you won't be upset with me if I'm redundant next week. Um, but I think, it's, I think it's a really important point. So it's probably worth being redundant about. Um, if we believe that God has a plan, then there are a number of troublesome theological implications. Um, one again is this question that if God has a plan, where does that begin and end? Um, so my dissertation was on the theology of the cross. And um, in the research I did for that, uh, it, again, it was in Germany. So in this land of, of the Holocaust, um, which is better known as the, as, as the Shoah, the, the deep suffering. Um, so uh, it, uh, I came across a reference by a rabbi who said um, that whatever you say about God has to be said in the middle of Auschwitz. And if you can't say what you want to say about God there, then, and the language is quite um, stark, shut up. Um, so Auschwitz was for this Jewish rabbi a litmus test. So can you say in the middle of Auschwitz, um, with the dust of Jews falling on your shoulders, the ashes of these once alive creatures put to death by hatred. Can you say there that God had a plan for this to happen, that this was somehow or another ruled by God? And even to suggest that um, tastes bitter in the mouth, right? And so, um, so it raises complicating questions about who we understand God to be if God in point of fact has a, has a plan. But wait, there's more. Um, there's another troubling piece, which is that if God has a plan, if everything is scripted, then we have no, we have neither agency nor investment in anything. So the fact that you are here um, in this Zoom call is preordained. You had no choice but to to do this. And if that's the case, then, you know, really, if you begin to think about it, um, it why bother? Right? <laughs> because whatever you're doing, you do anyway. 
And so there's no reason for uh, being riled up at injustice, um, nor is there any reason to be overwhelmed by sheer joy and delight because it's all programmed. You are nothing more than an actor on a stage and you have no uh, freedom to be able to even inflect your lines differently if God has a plan. So there is some problematic pieces with that term, even though um, I think if you were to ask most Christians, I would argue even most Lutherans, they would say, yep, God has a plan. But there's a different way of thinking about it that I think is far more compatible with um, not least of all Lutheran theology, which is that God doesn't have a plan, but God does have an agenda. Right, that God does have a vision for who we are and who we are called to be, and also what this world is called to be. And so that we feel grief or that we feel lament, that we feel distress, is an indication that God does not have a plan, but that we recognize that there is dissonance. Um, between what is and what should be. And that dissonance is an indication that God's vision is not fully present as it ought to be, right? And so it also then invites us to um, more fully embrace our freedom to engage the moment, to be an ambassador of salvation, to be uh, an anointer of balm um, in, in whatever present moment there is of grief. Um, if we had this notion of God as a plan, we would be far less inclined to do that because God wanted it anyway. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so, so this is this is part of the I think the important. It's it's not even a nuance. I think it's a whole a wholly different, distinct notion of understanding God. The the difference between God having a plan and God having a vision, to which God invites us to participate more fully. Mm -hmm. Does that? Yeah, I like, I, I really like that. That's uh, um, a, an invitation yeah. to a great life. Yeah. What? Well, right. What else could you have wanted for this hour than that? <laughs> right. That, <laughs> pack up, go home. <laughs> my work here is done. Right. That's exactly it. So, so I can't recall off the top of my head whether it's next week or the week after, but we're going to be spending um, the entire hour on something called process theology, um, which uh, is, is a, an, a take on God's action in the world and our response to it that has interestingly felt uncomfortable or has been um, not welcomed well within Lutheran circles. And I, uh, I have some hunches as to why, but they bug me. And, um, and I, I think there is just incredible compatibility between process theology and Lutheran theology. I think part of the concern is that um, if we think about um, God having a vision and we're invited into that vision, Lutheran hackles can kind of start being raised because we fear that that might be engaging in works, that we have to do something in order to earn God's grace. But that's got it all um, bass backwards, I'll say. Um, <laughs> um, because, because we don't do it uh, in order to earn God's grace, it's because we've received God's grace that we can't help but to extend it to others. You get this notion beautifully in Psalm 130, um, which is um, arguably a lament psalm, although the editors of the LBW didn't think so, and so they kept it in, which is a good thing. It was Luther's favorite song and in, or psalm, and in fact, he wrote a, a hymn to it, which we which we sing, and we might we might be familiar with it. It. I, uh, out of the depths I cry to you. That's the, that's the tune, right? It's a beautiful um, uh, minor keyed hymn. And, uh, and what's, what's gorgeous about this psalm is that um, the psalmist has done something and we don't know what. And in point of fact, it doesn't matter um, uh, for, for the purposes of those of us who sing the psalm with, uh, with the author. Um, but whatever it is has gotten the psalmist chucked down into the pit, which is generally not where you want to end up at the end of the day. And yet, as this, it, it, the psalmist says, Lord, if you were to mark iniquities, if you were to note everything that we've done wrong, who could stand? 
nobody could stand was uh, is obviously the, the rhetoric behind it, right? So if you, O oh Lord, could mark iniquities, who could stand? And, um, and implied is nobody. And then the, the psalmist does this, this beautiful turn. Um, but, right, there is forgiveness within you. And then the, the Hebrew says, so that you may be loved. If you don't anticipate that God will offer forgiveness, you don't love God, you fear God. And this is what was so crucial for Luther, right? That if you have a God who is a God of judgment, there's no reason why you should trust that God in the very least. And so you are going to do everything that you can do to earn these divine points, right? But, but Luther said, bullpucky. He said, um, look at this Psalm that there is forgiveness within you so that you are loved, right? So, so it, this notion of process theology recognizes that it's not about needing to do good works in order to earn God's love or fearing what we have done, the bad works that we have done, right? Because if we say that there's nothing that you can do to earn God's grace, that also means there's nothing you can do to jeopardize it either. Both are true. And that's what the psalmist says, right? If you, O Lord, were to mark iniquities, nobody could stand, but there is forgiveness within you so that you can be loved. And so engaging in works is simply a response to that, that grace, that forgiveness, and an extension of that love to the world. My favorite conversations have been when uh, Anna and I have talked about process theology, and so there's a lot more to come, and it will be wonderful. Are there other questions? Yeah. Hi, Anna. Stephanie. Hey, Steffi. Hello, hello. Hello, George. I don't know. I, there are a lot of people here. I don't know if George is still there, but George yeah, was my, my pastor when I was, since I was zero. <laughs> <laughs> Anna and I used to sing in choir to, to, together and make mischief. Very little, but some. And I I was caught by your, quest, your statement, Anna, about, um, you know, why are we so afraid of doubting? And as as Lutherans, um, and I I I have I um, in my twenties I left the Lutheran Church to the con Congregational Church um, mm -hmm. after a wonderful stint at at Grace Lutheran with George as my pastor because I believed I mean I, there was always room for doubt doubt at Grace Lutheran and right. there was never a shaming um, that went on. Um, by Pastor Madsen, if we did have doubt. Um, but then in the 90s, I don't know what happened, but it seemed as if um, the Lutherans learned that there was some uh, a contingency or a, a wing of Lutheranism um, decided that, that um, 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 if, if you were to be part of the tribe, um, you couldn't have doubt. Hmm. Okay. And there was a movement towards a more evangelical um, interpretation of Lutheranism um, that was too much for me because I always doubted. And, right. and the safe space that George created and um, Jean Wickman um, created at, at, at Grace Lutheran wasn't available to me um, in my 90s as I was rabble rousing and trying to discover who I was, right? right. Um, so so that's, I'll say that. Yep. And, and uh, when I, atten I att attended an Easter service at Plymouth Congregational in Minneapolis, yeah. um, Pastor Jim Gertminian, his sermon started with, we welcome you all, whether you, you believe the resurrection story to be myth, metaphor, or truth, you are mm -hmm. all welcome. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if you could comment on any of that. And cheers. <laughs> you're, my, <laughs> you're my happy hour. <laughs> it's gorgeous. You know, I um, I, I'm I know that I'm biased uh, about my father, but this notion of creating a space for questions was his agenda, his vision, um, and not 
not unique to him, um, but it was certainly an emphasis of his. So I think um, I, I think to be so uh, influenced by that at, in those crucial years was um, was simply a, a, in large part um, the benefit of of having dad as um, as our pastor um, at that time, because that was really a priority, not least of all with the confirmation students, so that they they learned early on that um, that they were not saved by their uh, belief, but rather um, by grace. So um, so that that I think is a is a rich heritage of of, of my dad's. Um, the uh, the the. The Congregationalists, also known as UCCers, United Church of Christ, um, they, um, they have this marvelous phrase, and it irks me to no end that they got it and we didn't, and that is, um, why does God put a, why, why put a period where God has put a comma, God is still speaking? Yeah. Right. I mean, that so should have been ours. And I, I may have mentioned this um, already uh, because I just love this story. There was a, uh, I was, I was presenting to a bunch of UCCers a while back and, uh, and I, I lamented that they had coined that phrase when we should have. And they said, we'll give you Nadia Bolt's Weber, or if you give us Nadia Bolt's Weber, Weber, we'll give you, we'll give you that phrase. Um, but, uh, but doubt is something that is inherent, I think, to, uh, to, to faith. And in point of fact, when you stop and think about it, um, the word faith inherently means you're not really sure. I, I know that it's dark outside. I don't have faith that it's dark outside. I know it, right? So faith means you're not entirely sure, but you're going to trust it as such anyway. That's what it means. So if you look in Matthew 28, and these are the disciples who had been with Jesus through the whole schmear, um, everything, uh, with the exception of Judas, right? And, and Jesus says, come on, y'all, um, come with me. Excuse me. And he goes up to the mountain, right? Where he ascends. I love the German word for that, by the way. It's uh, Ascension Day is uh, called Christi Himmelfart. Um, that's the German word for it. Anyway, that's my juvenile humor. But, um, uh, but there you had the disciples. And in the Greek, it says, um, we're, we're actually not entirely sure what it says, but it says either, um, so the disciples were there, um, and some worshipped, and some doubted, so we're not sure if there were disciples who worshipped and other disciples who doubted, or it could be that the Greek means that all the disciples worshipped and simultaneously doubted, but regardless, the word doubt is right there regarding the people who had been with Jesus and seen everything. They didn't have faith that he fed the multitude. They saw it, right? Just like I'm seeing it's dark outside. And so, so, so doubt, um, doubt is holy, right? But I think, I think inherent in doubt is also um, an implicit humility, right? Because if you if you think you know it all, um, then you have no reason for faith. Right? <laughs> um, there's an audacity there um, that is deeply uncomfortable. That is um, not just audacious, but um, arrogant. I, I think in quite a demonic sort of way. And so, um, so be belief um, implies doubt. Um, and I think, I, I think, again, we're not as comfortable with that, even as Lutherans, as we ought to be, because I think, um, in part because I think we've yoked the gospel too much to the notion of forgiveness of sins. And as we talked about um, in our first session, I think our sins are forgiven. That's grace. But the reason they are forgiven is the gospel, namely the good news, Evangelion, the good news that Jesus is risen, which means that um, no, nothing can separate us from God's love. That, that's, the, that's the news, right? And, and, and yet, if we focus on the forgiveness of sins, then our tendency is to, is to worry, right? Um, 
boy, I did this or I did that. And in point of fact, we can't ever confess all of our, if you could note iniquities, who could stand? Nobody could stand. But I think that we have, we're still anxious. We have to feel like we have um, all of our doubts taken care of and all of our sins uh, noted and forgiven before we die. Because after that, um, there's no point or there's no possibility of redemption. But we're still looking to death as if it's uh, ultimate, if it's, as if it's final. And if you believe that, then what's the point of Easter? Like, why bother with that? Um, so I think we have work to do to really reintroduce the radical nature of resurrection theology. Other thoughts or questions? Thanks, Stephanie. I want to say thanks to Steffi too. It was a great question, and yeah. um, and and that whole concept. I had a wonderful pastor as well in confirmation, and when we were the at at, at the service of confirmation, the affirmation of baptism. In his sermon, he said the key to having faith is to continue dealing with the doubt of your faith. Just, just keep doubting. Um, it, it drives you deeper. It, it helps you grow. It makes you think. It's it's a gift in and of itself. Right. There's a, a, a quick piece. Um, I'll, I'll, bring this, um, I'll bring this next week, but dad introduced me to a wonderful, um, uh, it was a photocopy. And just recently I was able to find for the two of us actual copies from a 1948 um, uh, museum piece um, uh, by Henri Matisse. And it was a retrospective of all of his art and the title in English was exactitude is not truth. And in it, he, um, he ha uh, had four self portraits, of a pen and ink um, self, uh, self portraits. And each of them were distinct. Oh, dad, I know what you're doing. It, yeah, I think, uh, are you doing it? Yeah, excellent. You got it there? Uh, not yet. <clears throat> okay. Um, this wasn't planned, just so. <laughs> um, so he has four self four self portraits. Each are distinct one from the other, but each are clearly Matisse. And you can't fully appreciate who Matisse is until you see these four pictures. And yet what Matisse suggests is you can't actually um, fully appreciate who Matisse is with these four pictures because there are an infinite number of ways of thinking about who Matisse is, right? Um, and so his point is um, uh, that if we think about truth as being something solid and clear and definite and limited, um, then the only thing that's limited is our imagination um, about what truth could be. And so there is, a, again, a dangerous audacity if we expect that we have to believe fill in the blank in order to right, receive God's love. Um, because God is far more complex than um, our limited capacities um, for imagination um, a, or grasping of the, of the truth. Um, in, in fact, um, how are we doing on time? Uh, and another thing that I hope to, to bring up next week, um, I, I was just reminded recently about uh, Yaroslav Pelikan, who was a, um, a, a, a church historian. Um, and those of you who have Minnesota connections and looking at you, Steffi, um, Matt Pelican recently run uh, or ran for, uh, an, uh, for office in Minneapolis or Minnesota. And he's Yaroslav Pelican's grandson. And, um, and Pelican did this gorgeous interview with Krista Tippett um, when her um, show was called Speaking of Faith. Um, and he speaks about the creeds and how the creeds are distinctly different depending upon the culture. Um, and, uh, uh, and he speaks about a, um, a, a version of the creed, and I wanna say it was in Namibia, where, um, I, where it speaks about how the, uh, the hyenas did not uh, get Jesus, right? Um, and we would not, and that framework doesn't make sense to us. Um, but it did to them, and that there's a truth there revealed simply by a whole different cultural context um, that we can't we can't comprehend. Dad, did you find that? Oh, good. Sure. Yes, sure. you can. 
a bit a, a little closer, Dad. And then I'm just like, yeah, over a little bit to your left. There you can begin to get maybe a, a couple of images of the different faces. Um, yeah, if you tilt it maybe a little bit closer to your iPad then. And I'll, uh, I, I will bring those too, but yeah, thank you. You can begin to see that there are some, there, that helps dad. Those are a couple of the faces and each one is distinct. Move it a little bit to the left toward the kitchen. There we go. Yeah. Nobody's got it all, in other words, and doubt acknowledges that. And there is the title. Thank you, Dad. Other thoughts or questions? I know we have just a few moments left. So far, Anna, I think this is my favorite Lent of all time. Thank you so much for joining us and for sharing your wisdom. And um, that somebody can think this is a happy hour. What a I think that's one of the best ways we could possibly describe Lent and, and how we're supposed to live our lives. So cheers to everybody, um, whether you're drinking water or coffee or tea or whatever you have in it. But, but this idea that we are meant to live abundant life is um, just a wonderful way of really getting at the heart of what this whole season is about and what it's leading us to as we as we walk towards Easter. So grateful. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you for the ongoing um, conversations that are part of this. And thank you, uh, Anna, for sharing each week. Very much appreciated. I am very appreciative of all of you folks who keep showing up. Thank you. That makes this a, a rich evening. So I'm grateful. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Anna and George. Good night. <laughs> Thanks, <Steph. laughs> Thank you. So I think yeah. we're going to end with go in peace, serve the Lord. Thank Thanks you. to God. God. Thank you, everybody. Peace. Thanks for being here. <laughs>